Good evening. Hope everybody is doing well. Had a good week so far. It's good to good to see each of you out tonight. Um, Acts 22 is where we'll start. You bump that down just a hair, Charlie. Acts 22. While we're turning there, we'll take prayer requests tonight. Remember this. of sickness going around right now. Yes, Brother Dave has got a stress test and that type of stuff on Friday. Any others? Anybody else? Pray for the upcoming church year. That'll begin in October. Uh, we will have a, uh, a list of the um, offices that are going to be open, uh, the ones that decided not to take theirs back. So that will be out this Sunday. So be praying uh, what the Lord would, would have you to do this upcoming church year. Uh, it's it's always, always a job. Uh, so uh, whatever your skill set is or whatnot, just be praying about that. And uh, like I said, that will be available for the next three weeks, four weeks, something like that. All right, well, if nothing else, uh, we'll have a word of prayer, and then we will get started tonight. Let's pray. Father, we come to you, uh, again, just thanking you for this day, this opportunity to be in your house tonight. Uh, we thank you for the, the great blessing of being a part of this church, and Father God, we thank you for our church and the members uh, that are in it, and God, I pray that you would just continue to work among us, and uh, God, I pray that we would just continue to grow in spirit, and uh, God, that you would just... Uh, we would just follow you in the direction you'd have us to go, Father God. We do, as mentioned, Father, pray for our upcoming church year. Uh, Father, we thank you for the church year we've had this past year and the things that we've seen done, the folks we've seen uh, join our church and, and be saved and, and baptized. God, what a blessing it's been. And God, I pray that we would not settle, uh, but God, we would continue to uh, just to seek you out in everything that we do. And we just we just, uh, we just just praise you tonight for, for your goodness on this church, Father. We, we pray uh, for each of these prayer requests mentioned tonight. Uh, God, uh, as, as we say every week, God, you know each and every intricate detail of each one of these. And God, we just ask that you would just touch and bless as only you can. And God, we just thank you that you're sovereign. We thank you 
uh, God, that you're able to heal, you're able to provide, you're able to bring comfort and peace in those situations, Father God. So, God, we just pray for each of these, God, that you would just, uh, you would just have thine own way uh, with those. Father God, we pray tonight, God, as we open up your word, God, you would help us as we continue in our study in the book of Acts. And God, I pray that you would just show us some things out of your word tonight. And God, I pray that we would be able to take them and glean from them and learn and, and God, use them uh, in our everyday lives, Father God. God, I pray this is something that we take serious. God, this is something that, uh, uh, God, we just don't let go in one ear and out the other. I know it's the middle of the week and it's busy and, and I'm as guilty as anybody, but God, I pray that we would just settle uh, in our minds for just a little while and take your word and, and be able to, to remember it and to ponder on it and to, uh, just to have it uh, available, God, when we need it in our lives, God. We understand that your word is powerful and it, it's needful for us. So, God, I pray that we would just feast on it tonight. God, we pray for those that are going to be teaching the children and the youth tonight. And God, we pray that you would just bless them as well. God, we love you and we thank you and we praise you. You've been so, so good and, God, we're so unworthy. But, God, we just thank you for it. And we, uh, but most of all tonight, God, we want to thank you for your son. It's in his name that I pray. Amen. Acts chapter number 22. Uh, if you recall last week, uh, Paul has finally uh, told the folks that, uh, that Ephesus there, he said, I'm going back to Jerusalem. And he makes his way back that way. He stops a few times as he's on that ship. And, uh, and, and everywhere he stops, it seems like the people try to, try to tell him that you shouldn't go to Jerusalem. You shouldn't go to Jerusalem. Bad things are going to happen when you get to Jerusalem. And Paul pretty much tells them, look, I, I'm, remember we talked about it the, the previous week. Paul had said, I'm bound in the spirit to go. I've got to go. That's where the Lord's leading me to go. And we talked about Paul's determination. It would have been easy for him to just, say, just lay down and say, you know what, I'm not going to do it. But Paul knew in his spirit that he had to go, that he had to move forward. And so he did. And when he got there, uh, that's kind of what we talked about last week. He got there. And it happened just as what said would happen. He eventually was arrested. <coughs> Excuse me. He was arrested. Uh, he, was, uh, he was beat there for a little while. And they finally took him. And uh, they're going to take him away uh, to the castle, uh, as mentioned. And then we get to verse number 40. And, uh, and Paul's talking to this commander, this captain. And Paul tells him, why don't, you, why don't you just let me turn around and talk to these people? Why don't you let me talk to these people? As they're leading him up, there's a, there's a great crowd there that's just hollering against Paul. That they just that just hate his guts pretty much. And so the guy lets him, and uh, we, we find in verse number 40 of chapter 21 that Paul turns around and Paul starts speaking in Hebrew. And when all of these Hebrews, these Jews, start hearing him talk in Hebrew instead of in Greek, they're like, "Hey, this guy he speaks our language." And it says that that as he's speaking that Hebrew, that they start listening. They actually give him a chance at that point. And so that's kind of where we pick up tonight in verse number one. This is Paul's, Paul's talk he's giving. He gives, he's going to give his testimony here. Paul says in verse number one, he says, Men, brethren, and fathers, hear ye my defense, which I make now unto you. Paul said, at least give me a chance. You may not like me uh, after my chance, but at least give me a chance. He said, here's my defense. And it, and it says again what we've already said in verse number 2. And when they heard that he was speaking in Hebrew uh, to them, they kept the more silence. And he said, that makes a big difference somebody speaking your language, don't it? Makes, somebody, it makes a difference. And so they kept the more silence. And he said to them, he said, I am verily a man. I'm truly a man, which I'm a Jew. He said, I'm just like y'all. Just like y'all. I was born in Tarshish, a city of Cilicia, yet brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers and was zealous towards God as ye all are this day. So, so he tells him about his upbringing. He said, I was taught in the law just as y'all were taught in the law. He said, I was, I, was, I was zealous after God, zealous after the things of God, the law of God. I'm, I'm just like y'all. Verse number four says, And I persecuted this way, when it says this way, it's talking about the way, talking about Christianity, talking about Christ. He said, I, I persecuted this way or the way unto the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. He said, I was in the same spot y'all are. I was taught the same things y'all were doing. I, would persecute, I was persecuting just as y'all were doing. Okay? Uh, and he said, also, as also the high priest doth hear me witness and all the estate of the elders, for whom I also, for whom also I received letters unto the brethren, 
and went to Damascus to bring them which were bound unto Jerusalem for to be punished. So he's telling his testimony. Verse number 6, And it came to pass that as I made my journey and was come nigh unto Damascus about noon, suddenly there shone from heaven a great light around me, and I fell unto the ground and heard a voice saying unto me, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And I answered, Who art thou, Lord? And he said unto me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. And they that were with me saw indeed the light, and were afraid, but they heard not the voice of him that spake to me. And I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said unto me, Arise, and go into Damascus, and there it shall be told of thee the things which are appointed for thee to do. And when I could not see for the glory of the light, being led by the hand of them that were with me, I came into Damascus. And one Ananias, a devout man, according to the law, having a good report of all the Jews which dwelt there, came unto me and stood and said unto me, Brother Saul, receive thy sight. And the same hour I looked up upon him. You know what Paul didn't? Paul didn't know what to say to these folks. Paul, Paul all Paul knew was knew what to do was to just tell his testimony. He said, I'm just going to tell them my story. I'm going to tell them that I was just like them and I had a radical encounter with a man named Jesus and it changed my life and it changed my route and it changed my heart and it changed me from the inside out. He said, that's all I know to do is to share my testimony. I'm going to tell you something. A powerful tool that you have in sharing the gospel is your testimony. It's your testimony. Your testimony may not be as powerful as somebody else's testimony, but your, your testimony is your testimony. And here's the thing. A lot of people had probably been telling these people at Jerusalem about Paul. They had their own, uh, they had heard rumors about Paul's testimony. They had heard the things that, that Paul had done, Paul had said, Paul had changed. They, some of them, we're going to learn here in a couple chapters, that Festus tells Paul that he's lost it. He said, your great learning has caused you to lose your mind, is what he tells him. And I'm going to tell you something, people thought that Paul had lost his mind, but I'm going to tell you something, Paul had had an encounter with Christ. And nobody knew Paul's testimony like Paul knew Paul's testimony. Nobody knows your testimony like you know your testimony. You know that? Nobody knows your testimony like you know your testimony. Paul could tell this, well, he could tell it with 100% accuracy because it happened to him and it meant something to him. You ever told a story that meant something to you? Maybe it's a story about a... a, a, a relative that's passed on that you really love. You, you can really get into a story when somebody's telling you that they're really into. You know what I'm saying? Paul was able to tell this because it meant something to it. It happened to him. Nobody knew Paul's testimony like Paul did. I couldn't help but think about that as I was reading through this today and uh, it, it just made me start thinking about our, our testimony and the, the witness that we have through our testimony. No, no two test It's like fingerprints. No two testimonies are the same. You know that? No two testimonies are the same. Your testimony is unique to you. And there's people that you can reach that I can't reach because your testimony identifies with them a lot better than mine does. Okay, use your testimony. It's a blessing to have a testimony, amen? amen. It's a blessing. I couldn't help but think of how some people's got powerful testimony. Some people ain't got a real powerful testimony. They don't really know much about God. They just know that God saved them. I couldn't help but think about the story of the blind man in the Bible, uh, that Jesus had healed him. The Bible says that he was blind from his mother's womb. There wasn't a rhyme or reason. Jesus said the reason this man was blind so that God could receive the glory. Nobody sinned to, uh, to, to cause it to happen. It was just for, for God to receive the glory. And they started asking this blind man that had received his sight, like, what happened? Who was the man that healed you? What did he look like? Where was he from? And you remember what he said? Remember how he responded? He's like, I don't know the guy. I don't know where he's from. All I know is that I was blind, and now I see. He didn't know all the details. He didn't know it in depth, but he knew that God had touched him and changed his life. And I'm going to tell you something. That's a story that you've got. If, you, if you're in here tonight and you've been saved by the grace of God, you've got a testimony. Amen. Use it. Use it. Paul goes on with his story. And he said the God, or his testimony, the God of our fathers. This is, this is Ananias still talking to Paul. The God of our fathers has chosen you that thou shouldest know his will. And see that just one, and should us hear the voice of his mouth. For thou shalt be his witness unto all men of what has seen, or of what thou hast seen and heard. And now, why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. 
And it came to pass that when I was come again to Jerusalem, even while I prayed in the temple, I was in a trance. And saw him saying unto me, Make haste and get thee quickly out of Jerusalem, for they will not receive thy testimony concerning me. And I said, Lord, they know that I am prisoned and beat in every synagogue, them that believed on thee. And when the blood of thy martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by and consenting unto his death and kept the remnant of them that slay him. And he said unto me, Depart, for I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. Paul's trying to make of excuses of why God couldn't use him as a witness and a preacher. God said, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to use you anyway. I'm going to use you. It ain't us that does the qualifying. You ain't got to be good enough. If God wants to use you, God's going to use you. And he said, I'm not going to use you at Jerusalem. He said, Depart, for I will send thee of far hence unto the to the Gentiles. And that's kind of what we've been talking about the past several weeks of all the Gentile countries and lands that, that Paul went to and he preached and won those people to the Lord. Has anybody got anything they'd like to share it stood out to you in those first 21 verses? It's pretty much just retelling the story of, of Paul's, uh, Paul's salvation. Anybody? Amen. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Anybody else? Yes. Amen. Amen. Absolutely. Anybody else? Amen. Yeah. Absolutely. Never turned around. That's right. Talks a lot about, I, I like the fact that Paul, everything that he taught the younger preachers under, Timothy, and Titus, and those guys, everything he instructed them to be, always be ready to give a defense for your faith, right? Be well-versed in the scripture. Paul, if you read through Acts, and, and we have a lot of it, but even his, his epistles and all that, like Paul's always ready, okay? Who's ready at this point? These people, they want to stone him right now. He's standing on a stairwell and tells these guys, hey, just give me just a second, let me talk. He's always ready, always ready to give a defense. Now, I, I admire him for that. Yes. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. The way they, uh, they wasn't called the church there for a while, and so a lot of they were going by by the way. And, and so that's, that's exactly what Christ was talking about, the way, uh, the truth, and the life. And, yes, that's the same. I've, so the King James doesn't capitalize that. It doesn't capitalize God a lot of times uh, with, with a big G. or, or he, it, it does capitalize God. Don't capitalize like him. Like other, I believe if you look at, the New American Standard, the ESV, or something like that, it'll capitalize it. Uh, but mine has got a reference, you know, to the bottom of the page, and it's got it capitalized. So, yes, so, yeah, it's just showing importance and, uh, as Ryan said, properness of, of that word. <coughs> All right, verse 22, the Bible says, And they gave him audience unto his word. 
and then lifted up their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for it is not fit that he should live. Paul just spilled his guts out. Paul done told him what, what Paul told them folks what God had done for him, how he had been transformed, how he had been preaching, how God had called him and, and used him, and, and man, what a great stuff. And Paul's like, and here's his response. Lifted up their voices at a way with such a fellow from the earth for it's not fit that he should live. That's pretty rough, you know. And sometimes when you get done preaching a tough message, that's a look you get. Like when you're fixing a dismissed service, like, get out of here, preacher. Y'all could laugh. That was supposed to be a joke. <laughs> Anyways. Uh, they said, for, for it is not fit that he should live. And as they cried out, they cast off their clothes and threw dust into the air. And the chief captain commanded him to be brought into the castle and told that he should be examined by scourging. That don't even sound fun, does it? Examined by scourging or whipping that he might know wherefore they cried so against him. And as they bound him with thongs, Paul said to the centurion that stood by, Is it lawful? For you to scourge a man that is a Roman and uncondemned. Paul knew God's law. He also knew the Roman law. And the Roman law, remember, Paul was able to gain citizenship because of the, the city he was from was under Roman rule, right? And so that used to be a Hebrew city. But so he's a Jew, he's a Hebrew, but he's got Roman citizenship. So he, he's able to claim that I'm a Roman. And he asked the guy, he's like, are you able to, to punish me and me not even be condemned yet? And the answer, of course, was no. Listen to what the guy Ask him. So when the centurion heard that, he went and told the chief captain, saying, Take heed what thou doest, for this man is a Roman. Pretty much telling the guy, You better be careful. Don't mess up. He can take us to court because of this. It's always been about court. Tell you what. Then the, cha- the chief captain came and said unto him, Tell me, art thou a Roman? And Paul said, Yeah. Not yes, but yeah. All right? And the chief captain answered, With a great sum obtained I this freedom. And Paul said, like a good patriot would say, I was born free. (laughs) I was free born. Then straightway they departed from him, which should have examined him. And the chief captain also was afraid after he knew that he was a Roman and because he had bound him. So Paul had a little bit on those guys now. They they really wasn't even supposed to bound him at that point. Uh, So Paul had a little bit on them. Story goes on. We're actually going. We're going to try to do twenty-three tonight too. Got to all kind of ties together. It says, and on the morrow, because he would have known the certainty, wherefore he was accused of the Jews, he loosed him from his bands and commanded the chief priest and their all their council to appear, and brought Paul down and set him before them. All right. So they they know he's a Roman. So they bring all the council together. Uh, so that they can try to try to figure out what's going on. This is where it gets good right here. Paul, earnestly beholding the council, excited almost, earnestly, said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. And listen to this. And the high priest Ananias commanded that them that, they, that, them that stood by him to smite him on the mouth. This Ananias guy... He's a punk. This is, this is the same guy that, that, that condemned Jesus even when there was nothing found against him. This is the same high priest, okay? <laughs> and Paul starts talking, and he looks over there. Have you ever said that to somebody just kidding? Like, Richard, I'm going to slap him. Yeah, that's what he said. And the guy did it. He did it. He slapped him. And then Paul said unto him, <laughs> God shall smite thee, thy whited wall. What that means, whitewashed. For thou sittest thou to judge me after the law, and commandest me to be smitten contrary to the law. Now this proves that Paul was not a pushover. This, this proves that Paul had some had some grit and some gall about him. That wall, that, that word right there, whited wall or whitewashed, it's only mentioned twice in the New Testament. One time is here. The other time we talked about it Sunday when Jesus was talking to the Pharisees. And he told them, he said, y'all are like those, remember, that you wash the outside of the bowl and leave the inside of the bowl dirty. And he said, y'all are also like those tombs, those whitewashed tombs that on the outside you look pretty and everything's all together, but on the inside you're full of dead bones. Y'all remember that scripture Sunday we talked about? That's the, that's the, that's the same reference there is what Paul's telling Ananias there. 
pretty pretty cruel is what he told him. He, he said, you, you look like you got it going on the outside. Dude, you're just as crooked as anybody out here. God will smite you. And they that stood by said, revilest thou God's high priest? Like they were, they were like impressed and at the same time a little bit appalled that Paul actually, actually said that to the high priest. Then Paul says, I, I wist not, or what that pretty much means, I knew not, brethren, that he was the high priest. For it is written, thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. Paul, Paul knew that law, right? Paul knew that law. And, and I'm surprised Paul didn't say, I didn't know he was the high priest because he sure wasn't acting like one. I, I can't, that's kind of probably what I'd have said. But he said, I knew not, brethren, that he was the high priest. For it is written, thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. Uh, all right, has anybody got anything to that point before we move on? All right, verse 6. But when Paul perceived that the one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, of the hope and the resurrection of the dead, I am called and questioned. And when he had so said, there arose a dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the multitude was divided. It tells us why in verse 8. For the Sadducees say there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. So that was their big division there. One of them believed in the resurrection, the other one didn't, and they went, they went back and forth on that. Uh, also angels and spirits. It says, And there arose a, a, a great cry, and the scribes that were of the Pharisees' part arose, and strove, saying, We find no evil in this man, but if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him, let us not fight against God. And when there arose a great dissension, the chief captain, fearing lest Paul should have been pulled into pieces of them, commanded the soldiers to go down and to take him by force from among them and bring him into the castle. And the night, I love this verse, verse 11. And the night following, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul. For as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. What's that say? Paul is there. He's in the castle. He's in the dark. He's afraid. He's terrified about what's fixing to happen tomorrow. I may lose my life tomorrow, Paul's probably thinking. But, it, but the Lord comforts him in the night and says, You know what? Just as you've declared my name here, you're also, I'm also going to allow you to go to Rome and testify of my name there. Ain't you glad those times in your life when it's dark and when you're tired and you don't know what's fixing to happen that God will come and he'll just put his arm around you and say, It's going to be all right. I still love you. I'm still on your side. I've got everything under control. I'm so thankful for those moments in our life when God does that. And I just can't imagine the, the weight that was off of Paul when that happened. I know Paul, remember what he said last week we talked about? He said, I'm ready to go to Jerusalem even if it means my death. I'm ready to go. And we talked about what a bold statement that was. But Paul's still a man, you know? He has to sit there and weigh on what's going to happen the next day. And when the Lord comes down, and he gives him that. What does the Bible say about him? He's a very present help in the time of trouble. He'll give us peace that passes all understanding. He, and he did that for Paul that night. And I couldn't help but, uh, but gain encouragement of that. Thought about times in my life where, where things have been tough or just, just tough, I guess is the best word for it. And just the peace of God will come and just give you comfort in those situations. Ain't, ain't he wonderful? Man, he's good. Man, he's good. And uh, has anybody got anything they'd like to share through verse 11? Was going to come. Absolutely. Anybody else? Absolutely. Anybody? Oh, 
right, we'll move on. It gets good, gooder. How about that? It's already good. It gets gooder. And when it was day, certain of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under a curse or under an oath, saying that they would neither eat nor drink until they had killed Paul. I'm going to tell you something. That's some of the finest pillars in the Jewish society right there, I guess. We're not going to eat or drink until we've, we've killed Paul. Remember what Gamaliel said way back, way back, earlier in the Acts, that if this thing's of man, it's going to play out. We ain't going to have to worry about it. If this thing's of God, what do you say? We're fighting against God. Not only are we fighting against but we're fighting against God. And they were more than 40 which had made this conspiracy. To have that many people want you to die that bad, like, what have they said about Paul? It's almost, I'll take your comparison to Jesus. Paul's not Jesus. Paul, Paul's a man just as you and I are. He's flawed. What has Paul done besides share the gospel, preach the truth, allow people to get freedom through the gospel of Christ? No. They're, and for that many people to want you dead that bad, or maybe that many people want me to do that bad. I don't know. But I'm just saying. That's a that's a not light guy. Do I know? Yeah. And they came to the chief priests and the elders and said, We have bound ourselves under a great curse or a great oath that we will not eat nothing until we have slain. And this is when the chief priest should have said, y'all are foolish, okay? That's when he should have stepped up. But he's just as crooked, as Paul's done mentioned to them. He's just as crooked as they are. Now therefore, ye with the council, signify to the chief captain or the commander that was over Paul, right, that he bring him down unto you tomorrow as though you would inquire something more perfectly concerning him and we, or ever, he come near and are ready to kill him. So you get what they're saying? Y'all bring him down tomorrow. We're going we're gonna to question him more, act like we're going to question him more, find out more about the issue that's going on. When that happens and when he gets down here, we're going to ambush him and we're going to kill him right here uh, during that event. Verse 16 says, And when Paul's sister's son, so that would be Paul's nephew, right? Heard of their lying in wait, he went and entered into the castle and told Paul. Then Paul called one of the centurions unto him and said, Bring this young man unto the chief captain, for he, has, for he hath heard a certain thing to tell him. For he hath a certain thing to tell him. So we took him and brought him to the chief captain and said, Paul the prisoner called me unto him and prayed me, to bring this young man unto thee, who has something to say to thee. Then the chief captain took him by the hand and went with him aside privately and asked him, What is it that thou hast to tell me? And he said, The Jews have agreed to desire thee, or to ambush thee, or to desire thee, I'm sorry, that thou wouldest bring down Paul tomorrow into the council as though they would inquire somewhat more of him perfectly. But do not yield unto them, for they lie in wait. They're ready to ambush him. More than 40 men, which have bound themselves with an oath that they will either neither eat nor drink until they have killed him. And now they are ready, looking for a promise from thee. So the chief captain let the young man depart and charged him, See thou tell no man that thou hast showed these things unto me. Couldn't help but think about the protection of God over Paul's life. What, what's the chances 
of his nephew being right there and hearing that go down. They didn't know that was his nephew probably. I don't know. But yet he hears it and he goes and he's able to save Paul's life at this point because of some something that he heard that he probably shouldn't wasn't supposed to hear. And I couldn't help but think about the fact of how sovereign and providential God is. If God has got a plan for God does have a plan for your life. Amen. He's got your steps ordered. And I'm going to tell you something. We should have great confidence in knowing that he'll leave us here until our goal is accomplished. He protected his life time and time and time again. He eventually does die. But I'm going to tell you something. Until his job was done, he was preserved. He was preserved. And I couldn't help but think the many times in my life that, that I don't even know about that God's protected me. Amen. Whether it was from a disease, whether it was from a traffic accident, whether it was from a tragedy at work, whatever. Think about the times God has... Maybe you, you may know a time. Where God preserved you. Miss Martha. Miss Martha talks about it all the time. God preserved you, Miss Martha. He had a plan for you. And, and whether you know it, and there may be times in your life, that, like I said, that you have no idea. You were sick for work one day. You didn't know why. I'm going to tell you something. God knew why. Maybe he was preserving you from something. Amen. That God is providential. And he loves us. And he's a protector. And I'm thankful for that tonight. And he called... Verse 23, unto him two centurions, saying, Make ready two hundred soldiers to go to Caesarea, and horsemen, three score and ten, which is seventy, and spearmen two hundred. That's a bad name right there. If I was going to be an army, I wouldn't be a spearman. At the third hour of the night, which is going to be nine o'clock, nine p.m., and provide them beasts or horses that they may set Paul on and bring him safe unto Felix the governor. And he wrote a letter after this manner. Claudius, Lysias, John, you approve of that? Okay. Unto the most excellent governor Felix sendeth greeting. This man was taken of the Jews and should have been killed of them. Then came I with an army and rescued him, having understood that he was a Roman. And when I... Uh, would have known the cause wherefore they accused him, I brought him forth into their council, whom I perceived to be accused of questions of their law, but to have nothing laid to his charge worthy of death or bonds. And when it was told of me how that the Jews laid wait for the man, I sent straightway to thee and gave commandment to his accusers also to say before thee what they had against him. Farewell. Then the soldiers, as it was commanded them, took Paul and brought him by night to Antipatris. On the morrow they left the horsemen to go with him and returned to the castle, who, when they came to Caesarea and delivered the epistle to the governor, presented Paul also before him. And when the governor had read the letter, he asked of what province he was, and when he understood that he was of Cilicia, uh, he said, I will, I will hear thee, he said, when thy accusers are also come. And he commanded him to be kept in Herod's judgment hall. So two chapters there, pretty, some pretty eventful, uh, eventful times in Paul's life. And Paul never... Paul never wandered from the straight path. Paul, Paul told the truth everywhere he went, and God protected him, and God is still using him. He's about to, he's about to stand trial before some, some, some big names, some big names, and, uh, and he's going he's gonna to share the gospel to them as well. So, has anybody got anything they'd like to, to add tonight? talking about where you at so yes in 21 remember they caused remember he was in the temple that he did that oath with that guy or whatever and they were there and when somebody recognized him that he was Paul and they said hey we gotta we gotta do something about this so they 
they pretty much started whooping up on him, if I, if I remember right. And they got him out of there, and they were taking him to the castle. Um, yes, there's a there's a word that I'm looking for in my head that I can't find. The barracks, I believe, which would be like a like a, like a holding spot for him. That's where they were going to take him. Yeah, until they could figure out what to do. Huh? Barrack, yeah. Yes, that, that, yes, that's pretty much where he was going. Because they, they tied him up at one point, and their fishing start whooping him right here, and said, "Hey, you can't do that. I'm a Roman." Yes, they couldn't do anything to him because he hadn't been condemned of a crime yet. Yeah. Um, that's that's how I interpret that. Yes. I'm going to tell you something. And my boys got hungry, I guess. I don't know. Got hungry and thirsty pretty quick, I imagine. <laughs> May have broke that oath. <laughs> Do what? Little Davy. She wouldn't let you. No. <laughs> Sometimes we fear rejection or fear, I don't know, what people think or say about us, but, I mean, they had to consider their life, you know? And uh, Like you said, that's a, that's a sobering thought. What's going on? What do you care about this guy? Yeah. That there's so much, you know, if he's going to kill him, this poor man is sitting here going to party with you and the other attack. I mean, to me, man, it's a tax for us sometimes. Yeah. We make an action from tradition or the fact that we're like, God's got his hand all over this. And he knows exactly what needed Paul to get to the end result that he could. Couldn't help but think you just talking about that, how he had a few helping him. He had one little nephew helping him out for a minute. Think about if the nephew wouldn't have done what he knew in his heart that he should have done. It had been a different story for Paul. I couldn't help but think about, think about, sometimes I think we preach to ourselves as preachers more than we do to everybody else. And, and I don't know, that word from Sunday just stuck with me about our character and like how God knows our character. You don't think God knew that little boy's character right there? I mean, he could have had any boy standing there. 
But he knew that this boy right here, he was going to do what it took. And praise God for, for that little boy. And so like you said, he went from having one on his side to, to 471 on his side. Amen. He knew he'd do what he, was, what he knew was right to do. <laughs> the garden. That's right. That 40 really changed their mind. You know what? We better... Probably right. I mean, yeah, yeah, because he's a Roman. He doesn't like to screw it up about twice already. He said, <laughs> make sure he gets there. And he's afraid. I mean, they do it. Verse 23, the third hour of the night, 9 p.m. goes back to you know like Mordecai I told Esther. Esther was there and he said, You've got an opportunity to, to make a difference for for God's people, but if you don't, somebody else will, right? That's a good point. I think we're all guilty of that at some point in our life. God's laid something on our heart to do, to pray, go call somebody, whatever, and we didn't do it. And uh we had to tote that around for a while. So just be obedient. Absolutely. That's right. Old Pete Chadwick always says this. What we're talking about here is this, it's easy preaching, but it's hard living. And uh, and it is. I mean, it's we can rally in here and talk about the things that we need to do for God and what he's calling us to do, but what are we going to do about it when we, when we get out there, you know? It's a challenge. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. 
anybody else. If you love your Bible, say amen. amen. There's a lot of good stuff in there, y'all. A lot of good stuff. As I encourage you every week, read ahead. Uh, next two or three chapters are some some famous verses, I guess you could say. Uh, so Paul's appeal to some, some very important people. So I ask you to read ahead and look forward to studying that with you in a few weeks. Good Lord willing. So, any any announcements before we dismiss tonight? Yeah, there's some slots available left if you want to help in the concession stand out there in the foyer. Shirt sign-ups as well. will be out three or four weeks. All right, well, if nothing else, I hope you all have a blessed week. Hey, everybody smile. It's all going to be okay. That's better right there. I uh, hope you have a blessed week. It has been just beautiful outside all week, and I'm so excited. Uh, I was about to sweat away, Miss Marilyn, but. But it's been nice this week. So, uh, hope you have a hope you have a blessed rest of the week. It's fishing get better, y'all. It's fall. It's the best time of the year. It's my favorite time. Leaves gonna change. Football games on TV. Ain't nothing good on TV. You know, what? now there'll be something decent on TV to watch. So, uh, I just look forward to, to look forward to fall every year, and then I'm ready for springtime to come back around when it gets here too. So. But uh, hope to see you Sunday. Bring somebody with you, and uh, be excited to worship with you Sunday. If nothing else, uh, have a great week, like I said. Brother Jason Bryan, you care to dismiss us tonight?